What is going on, YouTube? Lamont at large coming to you live, but I'm not live from Des Plaines, Illinois. Technically, we are still in the Chicago city, and I seen a squirrel up this tree, so I thought I would leave an empty tuna can full of caramel popcorn that I got from the homeless food bank. Somebody went up to my van and said, hey, uh, do you want to take this food box? I said, no. They insisted, and I finally took it, so I'll take the food and I'll feed the am animals with it. So, Mr. Squirrel will be back down any minute to uh, start uh, chewing on the delicious uh, popcorn uh, caramelized uh, stuff I left in the uh, tuna can. We're going to take a walk really quickly to John Wayne Gacy's house. I am fortunate enough to be able to do this where I could travel around the country, have you guys come with me. I know most of you guys that watch my videos aren't able to travel the way I do, uh, being it that you have careers, families, or maybe you physically can't walk around the cemeteries the way you used to when you were younger, and I am very uh, humbled and I do use that word, and I do mean humble to be able to have you come with me. John Wayne Gacy, I'm sure all of you know who he is. Uh, he is or was a uh, convicted serial killer. Uh, he has, to this day, been charged with the most murders in U.S. history. Now, there's other murderers that are suspected of killing a lot more people than John Wayne Gacy. We're talking about Samuel Little, who is suspected of being the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. And we're also talking about the likes of uh, Ted Bundy and, of course, uh, Otis Toole and Henry Lee Lucas. John Wayne Gacy is best known when you think about him, other than the 33 murders that he committed, he uh, would dress up as a clown and go to hospitals and uh, you know children's parties, stuff like that. He was uh, very involved in local politics here in Chicago. Uh, he was a big supporter of the Democratic Party, so much so that he has a picture with uh, Rosalind Carter, who was the wife of then President uh, Jimmy Carter. And uh, he was a successful businessman, a failure, though, when it came to just living a, produ a productive life and also a failure in marriage. He's twice divorced. And John Wayne Gacy, he had a couple secrets, a couple secrets about his life. One secret was, well, his penchant for young boys. This guy was a... I guess he would call, I guess the word wouldn't be a pedophile. I think the word would be called a hebophile, which is that he loves, he loves young boys, teenagers. That was his thing. That's how he got off. And not a lot of people knew when he moved to the area that he had been convicted of sodomy for sodomizing a teenage boy in Iowa. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 1968, but he got out after only 18 months. Believe it or not, back in those days, uh, that crime uh, involving children, you wouldn't get the amount of years that you would get now. So he moved here to this Chicago suburb and started a very successful construction company he was married at the time, and uh, he got a divorce in 1976. And after 1976, that's when he committed most of his murders. Is when his wife moved out of the house. He had the house to himself, and he was able to do whatever he liked. So let's talk about how John Wayne Gacy got caught. Uh, there was a boy by the name of Robert Peast that had went missing 
And there were some witnesses that said, because John Wayne Gacy, he was very well known in the community. Uh, believe it or not, he was friends with a lot of police officers and firefighters. As you can see, just by me speaking that, there is a fire department here on the street. Uh, this area right here, there is a rule. If you are a Chicago Police Department officer or a Chicago firefighter, paramedic, or what have you, it is a rule. For, I don't know if it's a law, but you have to live in the city of Chicago. And in this area, a lot of Chicago police officers and firefighters live in this exact area. The block that we're going to be walking on where John Wayne Gacy lived, it's full of cops and firefighters. It's a very, very safe neighborhood. And so he was very well known by cops and firefighters. Every year, John Wayne Gacy was committing his crimes. He would always buy a new car. He would always buy the same exact kind of car that cops, undercover cops would use. And that's how he would lure all of his victims. So there was several witnesses stating that uh, a boy by the name of Robert Peast was seen outside of a convenience store talking to John Wayne Gacy about a job. And how he, and this is how he would lure a lot of his uh, victims. He would prom promise them work. Sometimes his victims were, it was well known that they were gay. He'd promise them, you know, I'll pay you a couple bucks if I could take some pictures of you. He would lure them to his house. And uh, the trick that he would do to get them to uh, submit or to knock them unconscious, he would give them drugs he would show it them his clown stuff and say like oh hey you want to see a trick and then he'll slap handcuffs on them and then that was unfortunately all she wrote right there he would handcuff them rape them and asphyxiate them that was his uh way he would do uh most if not all of his killings so the police at the time didn't have any clue about John Wayne Gacy, uh, about the uh, unspeakable acts that it was occurring in his house. The police didn't know. They just knew him as John, and he was a hardworking businessman. So nobody suspected him of that crime. But after uh, Robert Peace came up missing, and several people were saying, like, no, have we seen, have we seen him talking to John about a job? And then all of a sudden he disappeared. And then you had several young men in the Chicago area who went up missing, came up missing, who fit the description in terms of like, you know, a similar look, a similar age, similar race as to uh, Robert Peast. So uh, detectives started investigating John Gacy. They were doing uh, basically 24 hour surveillance of him, uh, 12 hour shifts. He, when they, when John got on their radar, uh, he knew after a while that he was being followed. So at first, he didn't pay it any mind. He would often, in, you know, invite the officers for dinner or for breakfast, and they would take, they would take his, uh, they would take him up on the offer because he, these, they were not friends, but they were very well acquainted with John. He would just tell them, "Yeah, I know you guys are surveilling me. You guys think I have something to do with Robert Peace uh, being missing?" And after a while. I guess it, the heat started getting onto John that the police were after him. So he started acting very erratic. He started drinking very heavily. Uh, he was a uh, alcoholic and the constant stress of the police being on his tail. He continued to drink and drink and drink. A lot of times he was driving drunk. Always knowing that the police were following him, uh, he started disobeying traffic laws. This guy would run red lights, run stop signs speed he would uh get into road rage incidents with other vehicles of course why would you care about getting a traffic ticket when uh, you know damn well that you are responsible for the murder of him and 32 other uh, young boys and men so they're noticing his erratic behavior and uh they had a gotten a search warrant to search his house and at the time they didn't find anything unusual other than, I think they found like a ring, a class ring, like a high school class ring. And they were looking around. They seen some uh, sex toys, handcuffs, 
you know, hey, uh, John just said, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a homosexual. What are you, what are you mad because I'm a homosexual? So they're looking at this. They didn't really find any concrete proof, so they left. But as this continued, and John feeling the pressure, he actually hired an attorney to sue the city of the Plains uh, for uh, wrongful first harassment or for the for the constant surveillance. And the case was actually going through the motions in terms of his suit with the city. And one day he comes to his lawyer's office drunk, completely drunk, not completely drunk, but just pretty drunk. And he asks his attorney, hey, I really need a drink. So his attorney goes out to the car, gets a, gets a drink, comes back. And John says uh, that Robert Peace Boy is dead. He's in the river. He's in the Displains River. And the attorney says, well, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, he's dead. He goes, I'm responsible for at least 30 murders. And he just starts admitting to the crimes. And, you know, the lawyer doesn't know what to do. So John actually leaves. And the attorney's kind of stuck. He says, oh, no, look what I got myself into. Eventually, after doing more investigations, the detectives, they get a second search warrant. They get a second search warrant, and they search his house. They find a couple other clues. Nothing hardcore. All they've found so far is that this guy is uh, just like a kind of a, a freak when it comes to the sex thing. And mind you, this was before his, uh, he admitted to his attorney to murder. So after the second search, one of the cops had asked to use the bathroom. By the way, this is the house. Uh, now, I want to just preface really quickly by saying that uh, this isn't the actual house. This is the property where John Wayne Gacy lived. As you can see, uh, it is for sale. The asking price is $459,000. This is the property where John Wayne Gacy uh, lived. Um, the house was knocked down after all that happened and it was rebuilt. And from what I've uh, looked up online, um, the asking price of this house is a bit higher than what the market is asking. Um, it is. It has been, I'm not sure anybody lives there. Uh, this house has been on the market for quite some time and nobody has bit. So I don't know if it's the asking price or the fact of uh, the evils that occurred right here. Uh, but anyways, one of the detectives uh, had asked to use the restroom. And when he's using the restroom, he notices, because like, it's in the wintertime, and the heat is on. And there's a smell emanating from the heat duct. And, you know, being a detective, he knows that smell, which is the smell of death. And he tells his partner when they leave the house, he says, hey, that, uh, he goes, there's, there's, something, there's something there. There's something dead there and it smells like a dead body so you you couple that with the fact of Gacy admitting to his attorney like what he did and then a few days later you know John kind of blew it off it's like oh, I was just drunk well that's when John finally cracked and just simply confessed that was it. He simply confessed to the murder. He confessed to what he did. He told the detectives, he said, you know what? I'm responsible for 30 some odd murders and it's only right that I be punished for what I did. So the detectives, they come over here and John Wayne Gacy was arrested. He was arrested on December 21st, 1978. He drew them a map. He drew them a map of where all the bodies were. He hid all the bodies in a crawl space under his house. And even with the map, it was still very difficult for them to retrieve all the bodies. To this day, 11 of the bodies have been, uh, are, were unable to uh, be identified. 
And uh, that's when the whole media show started with John Wade Gacy. Uh, he was uh, convicted of the 33 counts of first-degree murder. He was uh, also convicted of a kidnapping and a sodomy uh, because one of his victims had actually escaped some some reason. He let him go. And that man testified that, yeah, John Wayne Gacy raped me. I, he drugged me. When I woke up, he was raping me. And uh, he was executed. Uh, that was back then when Illinois actually had the death penalty on May 10th, 1994. I could go on and on. I could talk about this for about an hour. There is so much, so much details to this crime. But, uh, yeah, so, anyways, uh, here's a couple things that you guys might not know about uh, John Wayne Gacy. He was actually a pretty good artist, if you want to use the word artist. Some artists will say that he wasn't a real artist, but uh, he made tens and thousands of dollars uh, selling his artwork. There was actually a couple of art uh, exhibitions showcasing his art that sold out this guy he was on death row for about 15 14 15 years and he could not paint enough paintings because they were such a hot commodity you know there is oftentimes a um a market when it comes to uh serial killer memorabilia and i'm pretty sure those paintings that they purchased back then are are worth way more today and uh yeah, I could. I feel I could go on and on about this guy for an hour, and I know often a lot of times people on YouTube do, but um, I don't want to turn this into a 45-minute video. Just simply wanted to show you the house, and it is still for sale. So if anybody wants to make an offer, I don't know if I should post the phone number, but you could easily find the phone number. I don't want people to uh, annoy this guy. I mean, I don't know. He could be just a guy that just an investment property guy or who knows but this is a very notorious house you know somehow i don't really feel any weird vibes but i don't know if that's because of the house being torn down or what have you but uh gacy was a a, a sick pig bully i mean this guy would only pounce on people when they were handcuffed or when they were tied. He didn't. He never attacked them uh, when they were just um, unbound. Just a complete loser, a complete scumbag, a, a bully, a, a pervert, a rapist, a molester. A lot of words, whatever you would want to call it. So, anyways, sorry for the long video. I often feel bad making these long videos. Because I feel that people, I feel that people, <laughs> they're like, get to the point already. Get to the point, Lamont. But, um, yeah. Yeah, this this house, you know, by the way, this house doesn't look like anybody lives here. So this house totally looks unlived in. There's no activity at all. And, uh, you know, you got to beware of the dog. Warning, we call the police, houses under surveillance. But that you can tell that the house inside, there's uh, dust in there. You got cobwebs in the trees. You can tell that people do come here to, to maintain the property. So it's a very well-kept property. And I, I do want to say, regardless or getting away from the creepy aspect of the house, uh, 459 this house would be worth about $2.5 million if you place this in Los Angeles. So to me... When I was told that this house was going for 459, I said, "Oh, is, that sounds kind of cheap. Is that cheap for the areas?" But the subscriber of mine said, "No, it's not. It's uh, actually overvalued." But um, it's a nice looking, very nice looking house. I will say that. So, anyways, guys, let me get out of here. This is going on 20 minutes already. Uh, just want to show you guys the house. So, anyways, coming to you live, but not live. From Des Plaines, Illinois, I am Lamont at Large, and I'm signing out. I'll catch up with you guys on the next vlog. Peace out.